Well, good morning. My name is Aaron Badley, and it's a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, let me give you the passage real quick so you can turn there. I'll keep talking to you, but 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, we'll start in verse 6. But yeah, uh, we are hailing from Indian Trail Church, but shortly to leave and establish a new church about eight minutes south uh, in uh, Princeton uh, Avenue area, if that means anything to you guys, West Spokane, uh, with, a, with a chunk of people from Indian Trail Church, because uh, that church has just been blessed by faithful people and newcomers, and uh, Indian Trail Church is, is bursting at the seams, so to speak, running out of capacity uh, with, with the natural and, I think, uh, biblically directed direction to plant a church. And uh, we're thrilled to undertake that work uh, and do that end of October. Also, so fun, so I think I made Dave's acquaintance and now friendship, growing friendship, like a year ago. And it's fun to just see that blossom in, in these, these fellowships and these connections across churches is, is truly astounding. It's a small world, but a big world all at the same time uh, is, is very fun. Even hearing about uh, you guys' stuff with Chile, so. But let's, uh, let's dive into God's word. I'll read the scripture and pray, and we'll dive in. This is 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. We read, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you've heard from me, in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you for this morning, for the gathering of the saints. We praise you and petition you uh, to feed us this morning from your word as you've already done so in song. Lord, we ask for your spirit to illuminate spiritual truth that we'd otherwise be dead to. Lord, may we use this time to contemplate how we would destroy and put to death the things of the old man and live in light of immortality and life that you've brought about in your son. Lord, may we do so guarding the gospel of your Holy Spirit. And may you speak powerfully through my words as we're faithful to your word. In your son's name we pray, amen. Well, it is amazing what we will suffer when we anticipate a reward. And some of you can resonate with this. I have watched the nearly unbelievable moment of a child eating a vegetable, <laughs> who, who moments before they were gagging, but the threat slash promise of ice cream <laughs> led to the veggies being gone. You know, I've, I've watched people stay up late, deny themselves sleep for things like a midnight movie release, that shopping deal, video game drop. But, but just the night before, no amount of persuasion or, or bribery could have got them to do something like a homework assignment. Some of you know what I'm talking about, yep. Uh, on a more serious note, maybe uh, we can think about the various ways people have sacrificed heavily for a desired reward. And many of us can think of parents and their sacrificial love and suffering to raise us at great cost to their own health, their finances, their personal dreams, 
It may have been people experiencing this incredible relational hardship for daring to share the gospel and the truth with a coworker, a friend, or a family member. And it's just amazing what we will suffer when we anticipate reward. And we come by this naturally. It, it's in fact how God has built us. And when we suffer in this life, as we follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we're able to persevere, we're able to push through suffering and death because we have a promised and guaranteed reward, namely our salvation by the grace of God. But could you imagine how devastating it would be if all those scenarios we, we just mentioned, strictly hypothetical of course, if they didn't have any of the desired rewards? You know, what if you told your kids they could have ice cream after veggies, but there's actually no ice cream? You know, what if you sacrificed everything only to realize there's no reward at the end? Without the reward, there's no motive to continue. And this is why Paul will tell Timothy, guard the gospel, keep the gospel. In other words, without the gospel, suffering has no purpose. Without it, your sacrifice, your effort, it's all wasted. And consequently, this is our exhortation this morning. It is guard the gospel, it's keep the gospel. Okay, but first, Paul tells us what we're guarding against. What we're guarding against. And look again at the text. So we read again in verse 6, I'll read it again. It says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Here, Paul is contrasting Timothy's calling as a pastor with the current temptations that are before him, specifically fear. And so he mentions how God gave us a spirit not of fear. We must guard against fear. Second, we must guard against shame. You see it there, Paul exhorts Timothy, do not be ashamed. And there are, there's legitimate reasons why Timothy would be tempted by fear and shame. So Paul, he's, he's writing to Timothy to come and visit him, but this is no ordinary visit request, like just swing by for lunch. No, Paul, he's in prison again. Paul is in prison, and Paul's pretty sure he's not going to make it this time, and he's right. Paul will be executed this time, and Paul's been in prison many times now, a couple times, and his social reputation is not good. It's not hard to imagine why. I mean, uh, you could just think of it this way. You know, no matter how nice a guy or gal is, if you heard they've been to prison three or four times, you might just say, hey, we'll pass away for the next guy. Yeah, that's, that's very human, right? Not only this, but this request for a visit is dangerous for Timothy. So there are guys who are causing very real problems for Paul, and so much so that in this letter, Paul warns Timothy about specific people. He names them. Don't mess with this guy when you visit. In, in essence, what you're, what you're reading is the closer that Timothy affiliates himself with Paul, the closer he potentially involves himself with Paul and Paul's enemies. And, and even more, as Paul's execution gets closer and closer, you know, Timothy maybe a sharp guy, not hard to connect the dots, that the same fate may be awaiting him because he preaches the, the same message from the same apostle of the 
same risen Lord, right? So the temptations that Timothy faces are actually no different than the ones we face today. Shame and fear remain two great enemies that tempt or, or, or might threaten our Christian hope. We live in a hostile world. We live in a place that hates God and worships self. We live in a society that relishes the act of seeing someone personally destroyed for daring to stand up against the regime. The word for that is usually cancel culture. And, and let me put you on notice, Christian. When you cast your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've, you've drawn a line in the sand. And, and consequently, it's not a matter of if you will suffer for Christ's name and lordship in your life. It's simply a matter of when and how. Notice also, Paul does not say, he does not say, suffering is the enemy. Suffering is not the enemy. It's our temptations in suffering that are the problem, namely fear and shame. And suffering, suffering is a way of saying that our worldly bodies and, and desires they're assaulted or, or destroyed, they're, they're done away with. And this could be something, anything from finances to relationships, your reputation, health, opportunity, death, prison, you name it. And this is precisely why Jesus will teach in the Gospels. Jesus will say this, he says, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, rather, Fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So Christ, Christ knows that suffering is coming, but it's against our earthly body. And we need not fear or be ashamed because these enemies, they cannot kill the soul. We have, on the other hand, been culturally discipled to believe that worldly suffering is the problem to be solved. It's, it's as if avoiding worldly suffering is the, the entire goal of our existence. We've been preached a gospel of, of financial excess, fake beautiful bodies, fake sex, fake biology, vain social media profiles, pharmaceutical addictions, mind-altering drugs, comfort eating, binge-watching, you name it. And all of these, they've been designed and, and created to numb us to reality and to avoid the perception of suffering. And yet, and yet we come back, Paul, Paul does not teach suffering as the problem, nor does Jesus Christ, and this means an application for you that any version of Christianity that follows the world on this issue, Christianity, it's not true Christianity. True Christianity is not a religion without suffering. Rather, true Christianity is a religion that suffers well, namely, without fear or shame for the sake of the gospel. Well, how can we be ready to share in sufferings like Paul, like Christ, like Timothy, like many Christians we know in our lives. Well, thankfully, friends, Paul knows exactly how to pastor his young disciple, Timothy. And Paul gives Timothy precisely what he needs to suffer well as he follows Jesus Christ. And it brings us back to the focus of our sermon. Paul will tell Timothy to guard the gospel. And therefore, Paul, he, to prepare Timothy for suffering, he once again gives Timothy the gospel. Look again at your text in verse 8. We read, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, of me as prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who called us, or saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. 
and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. You'll notice that the gospel is at the beginning. Uh, Paul encourages Timothy to share in suffering for the gospel. Okay, the, the gospel is also the conclusion of this section where Christ uh, says he'll bring light and immortality to light through the gospel. And, and sandwiched right in between is the gospel itself. And, and I, I would just encourage you to meditate on these verses on your own time. I think it's, it's just one of the clearest explanations of the gospel in all your Bible. But for this morning, we're going to approach this section with five questions. So if you guys are note takers out there, are you ready? We're going to approach this with five questions. So who, how, where, when, what? I'll do it one more time, okay? Who, how, where, when, what? Well, first, who? Who? Well, first and foremost, the gospel, the good news of salvation, is about God. Paul begins his gospel presentation by reminding Timothy that it is according to God's power that we are saved. God is Savior. God called us to a holy calling. And this is good news, friends, because when you say it the other way, instead of being saved, we're doomed. So listen, let me say it backwards. This is, this is silly, but, you know, according to the power of man who has not saved us and has not called us with a holy calling. You know, it's, it's ridiculous when you say it that way. However, that is the message of our time. You do a little good. God will see you. God will reward you. You do things in your power, in your strength. You'll be rescued. Do things according to your calling, your will, your desires, be true to yourself, and God will be true to you. And what I just said, what I just said gets the who of the gospel backwards. And in case we missed the point, Paul says it's not according to our works that we're saved. Look again at verse nine, Paul says, who saved us and called us to a holy calling not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. In the context of suffering in this world, this is incredible news, because in our distress, who do we look to in our time of need? Well, for many of us, myself included, the cause of anxieties, our bitterness, depression, often comes from the fact that we've been looking in the wrong place for relief. And more often than not, we've been looking at ourselves as the place to start. And, and we may think things like, you know, I'll fix, fix myself, fix yourself, then, then we do the God thing. You know, dust yourself off a little bit, read your Bible a couple days in a row for once, have a couple good days, then we can do this God thing. You know, I, I feel like God's kind of mad at me right now, so until I do X or Y, or don't do X or Y, you know, life certainly won't get better. And, and Paul, he cuts through all those false thoughts. And Paul gives us the only true object of hope, which is God himself. And in suffering, the most powerful thing you can do is to remember who has the power. God. Who has saved you? God. Who has called you? God. And whose purpose and grace determines your reward? God's. God's. And only when you get your who right 
will you be able to persevere in faith and in love? So that, that's the who of the gospel. Second, we have how. How does God save us? Well, God saves us at least in two ways here. God saves one according to his purpose and grace, and God saves us by calling us. And these two things are critical for perseverance. You know, Paul, Paul's actually so keen. He's so focused on God's providence of, of God's calling and purpose in his life that in verse 8, we, we remember Paul describes himself as a prisoner. But look again, Paul does not describe himself as a prisoner of Rome. What does he say? He's his prisoner, as in a God's prisoner. And many of us may sit here today in the context of incredible suffering as you cling to the gospel of God. And the worst thing you could say to yourself is that your suffering is not God's purpose. That you're somehow outside of the grace of God, that your life is so problematic, so large in the universe, that your suffering is beyond the reach of his grace, that somehow God's upholding the universe, but today your problems are so significant, so monstrous, that an infinite God let you slip through the cracks, and has been for quite some time now that you think about it. And those statements would only be true if you believed that the how of the gospel is about your grace, your purpose, or your sense of calling. But Christian, whether it's prison, cancer, poverty, rejection, severed relationships, again, you name it, those are not indicators of God's failure in your life. Rather, God has called you to a holy calling in the context of suffering and to do so in all faith and love. And all of this is possible, all of this is doable in the gospel because of the third question, where? Where? So God has located and secured his purpose and grace in Christ Jesus. Look again at verse 9. It says, according to his own purpose and grace, given to us in Christ Jesus. And you might look at me and say, Aaron, that's crazy. And also super unhelpful. Uh, if the good news of God, if it's located in Christ Jesus, that is of, of no benefit to me because, because very clearly I am over here. I am suffering over here, and if I've read my Bible correctly, and I think I have, Christ has ascended to the right hand of God, and we would have a location problem. But you'd be wrong, you'd be wrong. The purposes and grace of God are found in one location, in the person of Christ Jesus, and yet there could be no more secure location for God's promises to rest in. And that is because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Therefore, he lives forever. He is seated at the right hand of God. Doing what? He's perfectly interceding on our behalf before God the Father. This is from Hebrews 7, verses 23 through 25. And I'll read this. Hebrews 7, 23 says, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, Jesus, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Well, moreover, Jesus Christ is the best place for God's promises to rest in because Christ is perfect. And, and therefore, in, you know, in conclusion, 
as a savior, there's no possibility of a mistake. There's no possible loss. There's no, there's no fumble from Jesus Christ as he brings those who believed in him to God the Father. And we get this from places like John chapter 6, I'll read 37 through 40. John 6, 37 says this about Jesus' perfect ministry. Jesus speaking himself says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I've come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Christ's ministry is perfect. And finally, Jesus is the perfect place for God's promises to rest because God has joined us to him. Uh, we are united to Christ, and you'll sometimes heard this referred to as union with Christ. And what this is saying is we're so, we're so completely joined to him that all the penalty of our sin, he carried he took on his body when he suffered and was crucified and buried. The penalty was paid. He rose from the dead. And on the other hand, so completely are we joined to him that all of Jesus' accomplishments, his obedience, his righteousness, they're counted as ours. And it's kind of like a marriage. You know, when God sees us, he no longer sees us in our former corrupt and, and wicked state. Instead, when God sees his church, what does he see? He sees a beautiful bride, washed, cleansed, nourished to perfection because she's one flesh with her husband, Jesus Christ. And this union with Christ, it's, it's everywhere in your New Testament honestly, but Ephesians 1 may say it most succinctly, which says, this is Ephesians 1, 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So the where of the gospel is in Christ Jesus. Well, Paul then gives the when of the gospel. And interestingly enough, when we talk about the gospel, there are actually two dates to keep in mind. So look, look again at the text in verse 9. It says, Who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now have been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus. So the, the two dates of the gospel are eternity past and the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus. Well, in the gospel, in the good news of salvation, we are strengthened by the knowledge that God's purposes transcend time itself. That, that God's grace was given to us in Christ before the ages began. This does, this does hurt the mind to consider. Well, I'm not going to lie. You know, immediate questions arise in my head like, you know, how can God give me something that I wasn't alive to receive? You know, I wasn't born before the ages began. Uh, how, how, you know, how, how does this work out? He still gave me grace in Christ Jesus. Um, and this just raises so many questions, right? But many of which I, we can't answer precisely, but the importance of this for Paul and for us is this. 
because an infinite God with infinite power acted on our behalf before the ages began. Therefore, nothing in time, nothing between the ages can separate us from the grace of God. Now, think, think again about what we're talking about in the temptations of suffering. We're talking about fear and shame. Well, fear and shame, they are destroyed. They're destroyed by the knowledge that nothing in this age can possibly thwart the grace of God given before the ages. Yet no Roman imprisonment, no, no illness, no shift in geopolitics, nothing can interrupt the purpose and grace of God given to us in Christ before the ages. So God's, God's gospel, it first took place before the ages. Second, the when of the gospel happened at the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus. Well, because of the appearing of Jesus Christ in history, in effect, God's affection and intentions for mankind, they've gone public. And his accomplishments are now undeniable. And we can now say, as we sing this morning, sin has been utterly dealt with in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, in literal time, in a literal place, in a little history, literal history. And the rulers of this world, though, Satan, uh, Jewish leaders, Rome, you know, they've all been exposed then for the liars that they really are. And this has to sink into our hearts. You know, I think of, even of myself, you know, how much of our lives are looked, looking for something significant, you know, something profound to determine or, or validate our existence. And, and until we get it, we suffer with these unmet expectations. Uh, I mean, it might be something as, as simple as a graduation date, a career, a better career, improved health, reputation, respect, Marriage, kids, I mean, you, again, you fill in the blank. But Christian, the most significant event in history of your life has taken place, and it happened 2,000 years ago in the public ministry of a man named Jesus Christ. And when you doubt God's goodness, when you feel like life's too heavy, it's unbearable, I would challenge you to reevaluate your view of history because God's love for you was fully demonstrated in the sending of his son, Jesus Christ, on your behalf. And you, you need to look no further than God's work in the life of Jesus Christ, because it is only in Jesus Christ that God's promises are yes and amen, yes? Well, finally, Paul gives the what of the gospel. Paul explains what the result of all this actually is. So look again at the text, verse 10. Paul says, uh, in which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Well, the gospel, you know, the good news that God has saved us, is that God has saved us from the power of death and has brought us life and immortality. We're called to guard against fear and shame, and there are fewer things more shameful and fear-producing than dying and agonizing death as a, a criminal, which is true of Jesus Christ. It's soon to be true of Paul, and yet, praise God, that very power of death is the very thing we have been saved from. And we have instead been guaranteed life, immortality, which we already possess in a resurrected and ascended Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what it looks like to live as immortals is probably a sermon for another time, and yet, Paul is concerned that fear and shame, they might 
cause us to forget what God has accomplished on our behalf. And the goal of the enemy is to distract you from the finished and guaranteed work of God through Jesus Christ. And the enemy uses all its tools to do so. For Timothy, for Paul, it was the imminent danger of prison, execution, persecution. But today, that's still true. And the enemy also tempts us with things like idolatrous imitations of immortality in the forms of promised perpetual youth, material comfort, things of that nature. And, and you just cannot be fooled into thinking this means you'll avoid suffering. When you challenge the world and you do away with the fake idols of comfort, this false life, the world hates you for it. And the world will do what it can to see you suffer for exposing their foolishness. And Paul, Paul gave Timothy the gospel. And this is the gospel that is powerful over fear, over shame, even death. It's, it is actually the very power of God. Therefore, Paul's command to Timothy is very simple. It's guard the gospel. Keep it. Secure it. And listen again from verse 10 as Paul explains. Paul explains that again that Jesus Christ brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. So hear, hear Paul's logic. He's not ashamed because... He knows the gospel. He knows the character and power of the God that he's believed in. And therefore, Paul's convinced, which, which really is just an aspect of belief and faith, he's convinced that God is fully capable of keeping his end of the bargain until judgment day. Paul's convinced that God will keep the gospel secure which God gave him to preach as an apostle. And so, since God's faithful to keep us secure in the gospel, Paul turns to Timothy, and he says in verse 13, follow the pattern of the sound words that you've heard from me, and the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. To guard the gospel and to follow the example of Paul, you must have two things, two things. One, you must have sound words from an apostle. Two, you must have the Holy Spirit. And you'll notice also, these are things that don't depend on you. Okay, so first of all, they're God's words given to you. They're not your words. There's nothing you have to conjure or, or make up. You don't have to discover some unfound mystery to follow God. He already gave his words to you. It's, it's your Bible. It's, it's the very words of the Lord Jesus and his apostles. And that's it. Praise God. Look no further, yes? And notice also you're going to follow these words with faith and love. And you might say to me, Aaron, I lack both of those things all the time. You know, my faith is tired. My love is often fickle at best. And I know, it's a good thing Paul didn't ask you to look in yourself for those things because Paul calls you to follow these sound words in faith and in love that are in Christ Jesus. This is so important because, because sometimes we get the gospel right initially. You know, we're saved, we're brought, we're justified, yes, done, got it. But then as we live the Christian life, we kind of accidentally toss the gospel aside while we live in our own strength. 
And Paul does no such thing. Paul gets the gospel right. And he teaches how to live with the same gospel. And he reminds you that the true location of your faith, of your love, they're not found in you. They're gonna be found in Christ Jesus, truly faithful, truly loving. Okay, second, Paul says Timothy must have the Holy Spirit so that he can guard the gospel. So not only is our faith and love found in Christ Jesus, but God equips you to keep his gospel with his very own spirit. And even more, you know, the, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's not some genie or something like waiting to be unlocked every Sunday when you come to church. No, no, no. What does Paul say? The Holy Spirit dwells in you. And what this means, friends, is that the resources to persevere in this life are both abundant and accessible. God himself saved you according to his infinite power. God himself gives you purpose and grace through the very son of God, Jesus Christ. God himself dwells in you to help you guard the very gospel he is already guarding. And in application, this means that the salvation provided by God has no weaknesses. There's no point of failure. There's no breach in security possible. And the only threat to the peace of the gospel is the threat of fear and shame brought in the context of, of suffering. And it's not, again, because suffering poses any real threat, but because by it, the world may rob you of enjoying true life and immortality that God so perfectly secured. When we suffer for the sake of a reward, the threat is only the possibility of the reward being taken away. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1, we've seen how in Christ Jesus, by the power of God, by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, there's no real threat. And therefore, we can suffer well in faith and in love, all for the sake of the gospel. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you for this morning. We praise you for the words you've given us by your son, through your apostles, preserved and illuminated by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we worship you as a God who provides all that he commands to love, to walk in faithfulness, to suffer for the sake of the gospel. Lord, may we have eyes that look to your son and find our security and our strength and our resources in them, not in ourselves. Lord, as we are, as we are beaten, we're trodden, as our flesh, the world, and the devil press upon us, may that all the more encourage us to abandon the old self, to put to death the flesh, and run more eagerly to the words by the power of your spirit that would give us and remind us of true life. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen.